Good morning, everybody. Um, I would like to give a piece of advice to everybody. If you are ever going to go into the kitchen and get ice out of the ice cube tray, and Bob Green has gone in and got ice before you, make sure you take a good look at that tray before you spill all the water all over your legs from it. Hey, at least I filled it. <laughs> and I emptied it. <laughs> All right, well, welcome everybody. Happy Father's Day to everybody. And uh, let's go ahead and stand and sing our first hymn, number 516, I Love to Tell the Story. Okay, if we could have our seats, please. And let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are, we are so thankful to be able to be here today to, uh, to celebrate the Lord's Day 
and to uh, give praise and honor and glory to you. We are so thankful, Lord, for all that you've done for us, for salvation through Jesus Christ, something that we could never obtain ourselves, Lord, but you saw fit uh, to, to provide this free gift to us of faith in Jesus Christ alone and, Lord, for salvation. And, and Lord, we thank you for all the wonderful things that you've given us, and we do thank you for our fathers, Lord. We thank you for um, our dads, uh, a lot of us are fathers. We thank you for that privilege of being fathers. And uh, just ask, Lord, that uh, you could help us, even, even uh, with our children, to encourage them to be good fathers and to carry that on through to our grandchildren and such. Now, Lord, we ask for your blessing on our services today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let me uh, go over some uh, announcements. We, we do have a church picnic that's planned for the 23rd. Is that next, next week? Next week? Can you promise and I promised that we deacons would, would figure it out. <laughs> And we didn't do that yet, so I'll send an email out it's saying exactly what we're going to do. But we do know this. It'll be after the morning service, so there won't be an afternoon service next week. Um, uh, bring something to, to cook on a grill and uh, also a pass-around plate. And then if you have any, uh, any games like uh, a beanbag or bocce ball or, or whatever, uh, you know, bring that too, and uh, and wherever we're going, we'll have a fun time. So that's our church. Chairs. What's that? Chairs. Oh yeah, and you'd probably want to bring a couple chairs uh, too. Um, and then um, also next week on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., we're having a church garage sale. We We've uh, done a lot of cleanup around the church, and, and there are some items here at the church that were just too nice to get rid of, so we thought, let's have a garage sale. We've done this before. And, and the idea is, if anybody wants to participate in the garage sale, um, uh, we'll be setting up the garage sale on Wednesday from 3 to 5, and um, uh, and then the garage sale is Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 9 to 5. And then Saturday, if, uh, if whatever you had brought doesn't sell, you have to take it home with you Saturday night. Because uh, by, by 5 around, well, after the garage sale is over. So we're talking around the, like the 5.30 area. And the idea is that uh, uh, anything we make is going to go to the general fund of the church. And um, the ladies have also asked if, uh, even if you're not planning on being a part of the garage sale, we're looking to have cookies that we can give out. Uh, so if anybody can drop off some cookies, uh, homemade preferably. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to have juice and stuff like that. And, and this is, uh, you know, it's an opportunity for us to get rid of some of the stuff we have in church. and. And certainly, it'd be a fellowship opportunity. But it's also a way to try and uh, get people to come in the door and actually see the church and be able to hand a flyer out to them about the church or track, you know, and, and such. So it's a it's a good uh, community outreach event too. So if you're interested in participating, you can see Kim or Janet about it, and. Um, then let's see, in, uh, in July, on July 13th, we have our next ladies' book study from, on Saturday from uh, 10 to noon, uh, going through the book of Ephesians. And then on the 14th, uh, we're having uh, communion that day at church. Uh, and then also on the 14th, we're having our quarterly business meeting uh, during our afternoon service. And uh, we did have a special business meeting, uh, uh, was it last week? We, uh, last week to talk about some, a vote on some proposals that we had had uh, to put into the Constitution. We've had those posted for three weeks, and every, every one of the proposals did pass. 
and we did include it in, uh, so that we will now update the Constitution and, and put those in. Uh, but in our meeting, we discussed a couple other things that we felt needed to be part of the Constitution, too. And, and really, they're just, there are a couple items that help spell out a little more of the role of the treasurer and the clerk. These are deacons' positions, and we just wanted to better define them. And so we have those proposals posted on the bulletin board, and they'll be posted for the next three weeks, and then we'll have our, our business meeting, and as part of that business meeting, we'll vote on these proposals too. Okay? And then, um, and then our, our uh, July church picnic will be on July 21st, and we'll, we'll try to get that planned out a lot more in advance. Uh, but uh, I, those are our announcements, I believe. Anything else? And so let's go ahead and uh, sing another hymn, hymn number 283, There is Power in the Blood. We can remain seated for this one, 283. Pentecost, Peter is going to be speaking, beginning in verse 14, but Peter standing up with the eleven raised his voice and said to the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, but these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath. 
blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, Excuse me, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Paul? All right. Uh, let's uh, sing another song, and we'll stand for this one. Hymn number 539, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. 539. Thank you.
thank you, ladies. And Carol, you come up and share the word of God with us. A couple of things. Uh, as we all know, <clears throat> we're looking for a new pastor. So our pastor left eight months ago. It's been that long. Just a reminder that we do have a sheet that Paul has put back there with different jobs in the church. Most of them, I think, are filled, aren't they, Paul? Uh, but take a look uh, if there is something that anybody thinks they might like to do to help out a little bit. Please feel free to write it on a slip and put it into, don't, don't write it on the sheet itself. Write it on a separate slip of paper and stick it into the little suggestion box in there. Uh, even if it turns out that somebody else is doing that particular job, it's good to have backups. Uh, I, I will tell you that it was kind of fun. Uh, Larry and I came out to mow lawn, and Larry's been really great about helping. And normally, if you're by yourself, it takes anywhere between three and four hours to do it. In about an hour and a half, we were done with two of us doing it. Marvelous to have that happen. So, Larry, thank you so much for that, for all that. And Larry also does maintenance on the, on the mowers out here, make sure that they stay in good shape, uh, especially because he likes to break them. <laughs> I joke about that because poor Larry, he was doing the strip on the back. Everything was going smooth, perfectly smooth. He got all done, came up, was going to go and drive up to go into the into the garage up there because we were done. And as he went, all of a sudden, something dropped, flipped off the bottom of it. He kept going, and there was a blade that just off, laying off to the side. The bolt that held it just snapped. We have no idea what he didn't hit anything. It just snapped. But I like to harass him that he managed to break it. Uh, so just keep in mind, though, that we still need jobs. And keep, us, keep in prayer uh, that we will find the, the right person uh, for a pastor. Uh, if you would, please turn to John chapter 5. Uh, we're going to, I want you to keep your finger there, but for a while, in a little bit, we're going to take a look at a couple of other passages. One of the things that police officers in particular really need to have in many cases are witnesses to what goes on. You have a traffic accident, and I can tell you, Myself, when I was working, Carl, Bob, we could tell you how many times you got there, there were two drivers, nobody else, and you get, you know, it's to, you did this, you did this, and it's your fault, no, it's your fault. And, you know, fortunately, most of the time, you have enough experience in accident investigation, you can pretty much tell who did what. But witnesses can be really important. And it's really important that a witness be credible. And it doesn't do a bit of good if you have a witness who lies through his teeth. I still, one of my favorite cases ever, guy gets, his, his ex-wife complains that he has assaulted her. So I am in the process of taking this complaint. The man's new girlfriend came out of the apartment where they were and said, what's going on? And I said, well, she said that Mike hit her. And a girl says, that's ridiculous. I did it. <laughs> she said, they were arguing, and I got sick of it. I reached right across her shoulder and punched her in the snoot. This is just the way she put it. This is in my report. All of this. And the prosecutor at that time issued a warrant for this guy for assault and battery. I had, as one of the potential witnesses, I had the ex-wife's new boyfriend there. And I said, what did you see? I didn't see anything. Right. Goes in the report. I'm not happy when I find out that Mike is being, has been arrested on this warrant because he's innocent. I have no doubt that his new girlfriend was telling the truth. She knew she could go to jail. Why would she lie? He wasn't that bad a guy. It wasn't like he was in and out of jail all the time. 
No reason for her to lie about it. So we get into court. And the ex-wife's new boyfriend gets on the stand and he's telling about this. He's telling how this happened and what was said here and all the rest of that night. I looked at the prosecutor and I said, you put me back on the stand. He's lying through his teeth. Now the prosecutor had already told me that he intended to get this guy convicted. If he puts me back on the stand, he in essence becomes the defense attorney because I'm going to say that the witness who was supposed to be on his side is lying. He put me on the stand. It was great. I loved it. Because, oh, it was marvelous. Because when the prosecutor asked me what he said, I looked right at the jury and I said, he said he didn't see anything. And the jury's sitting there, kind of like all you people, you know, just normal faces. And you could watch their faces just. I knew it was going to be an innocent verdict, and it was. It was great. And I turned, I, I turned the mic right in front of the prosecutor and said, congratulations, Mike. <sighs> Only time I ever saw a case in court that I lost that I liked losing. <laughs> that was great. You know, but witnesses are important, and credible witnesses are important. Witnesses that lie through their teeth are ridiculous. Now, was the guy telling a certain amount of truth when he said all the things he said after telling me he didn't see anything? A few of the things he said were the truth, but some of them weren't. But don't waste your time lying to me. Now, we all know that witnesses don't always agree to things. We can all tell you, you go to an accident scene and you get four witnesses and they don't agree on every detail. It's very rare that it happens. That doesn't mean that they're not telling the truth. They may be telling the truth. But because they're in different spots, they see different things or they hear different things. And so you get little things that are a little bit different. And Perfect agreement doesn't always make a great deal of difference in those particular kinds of cases. But now as we move into John chapter 5, we've already seen how Jesus is beginning to face more opposition. And it's going to get worse as time goes on. And I don't know how you would take things, but I occasionally listen to clips of some of the false teachers around. And I told you about the one that he said, do you want to know what God looks like? Because he's part of the little gods thing. That we become, in a sense, little gods. Because, you know, kittens give birth, or cats give birth to, other, to kittens. Dogs give birth to puppies. People give birth to people. So obviously, God gives birth to gods. Wrong. Totally wrong. Now, if you heard somebody come along and start claiming that they're the next Messiah, now we all know different, but how would you feel as you listen to them? Wouldn't one of your first reactions be, what gives you the right to say that? I'm hearing you talk about this. What proof do you have? Well, these people, these Jewish leaders, are, going to, are confronting Jesus, and they want to know, basically, how he can say these things and why he can say them, and they don't like what he says. If you remember, uh, at one point, uh, he said, you know, back in uh, verse 17 of chapter 5, my father's been working until now, and I have been working. So what do they do? They picked up stones, they were going to stone him, because it says not only did he break the Sabbath, according to their rules of what the Sabbath should be, but he called God his father, making himself, it says, equal with God. Jesus will go on to 
talk to them about this, he says, most assuredly, the son can do nothing of himself. What he sees the father do, uh, you know, the son also does in like manner. And he goes on about all, all of this. And then we get to verse 31, which is, you know, this is where we're going to see a number of witnesses to Jesus. And every one of these witnesses is important. And while there may be some differences in the way they approached things, all of those witnesses are in agreement. Unlike those of us who have investigated traffic accidents and don't always see agreement, all of the witnesses to Jesus ultimately agree. They may come at it from different angles, but they all agree. Again, you know, in verse 30, we're back up to verse 30, Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And then in verse 31, we get into this idea of witnesses, because here again, they're confronting Jesus. He's claiming to be equal to the Father. And Jesus says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Turn, keep your finger, please, in John, and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17 for just a moment. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, and verse 6, it says, Whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. He shall not be put to death on the testimony of one witness. So when it comes to murder convictions, you have to have at least two witnesses, and you can see the same thing in Numbers chapter 35. Look to Deuteronomy chapter 19. The page is over. In verse 50, it says, One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. You say, well, okay, well, that's the Old Testament. Turn to Matthew chapter familiar chapter, Matthew chapter 18. Well-known passage on church discipline. Beginning in verse 15, it says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if you will not hear Take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. The same principle as in the Old Testament applies in the New. In fact, later Paul will say you don't even receive an accusation against an elder unless there are two or three witnesses. So when Jesus says that his witness, if he witnesses, he said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. What he's really ultimately saying here is if I witness, if I'm the only witness, my witness is not true. And actually, there are some translations that put that in there. If I only bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And Jesus will go on to say, there's another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Now, if you were to look at the next verse after that, you would think that relates to John the Baptist. I don't agree with that. I think that particular thing relates to God the Father, which we will again see later. But turn to John chapter 8 for a moment. Keep your finger in chapter 5. 
and turn to John chapter 8. In verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one, and yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness. So Jesus, as he's talking to these people, is saying, if I'm the only person who's bearing witness about me, it's not true. But I'm not the only one. There is someone else. And in particular, he starts off with John the Baptist. Now, I, I mentioned the father, but that will come back later. But he says, you've sent to John, and he's borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. John had been ministering for some time. He's baptizing with the baptism of repentance. He baptized Jesus, even though Jesus was sinless, because Jesus, I believe, is identifying with his people because he is going to take our sins upon himself. They heard John preach. John hasn't always been nice to them. And at one point he says, who told you to come and repent? Right? A little sarcasm in some sense there. John it can be very strong, and Jesus can also be very strong. It's interesting, one of the, one of the passages that was read this morning that uh, Bob had read in Sunday school, where Jesus called a person a hypocrite for what he said. He could use some pretty strong words. He talked about people being brood of vipers, being whited sepulchers. Because he knew what these people were teaching and it was wrong. But John the Baptist told them the truth. He said, you've talked to John. You've said to him, he's borne witness to the truth. Now he goes on to say, I don't receive testimony from man. I think what he's saying here is, that's not the most important testimony there is. As important as it is, it's still not the most important testimony. So you have Jesus who's already testifying to who he is because he's made himself equivalent to the Father by what he said. We've briefly seen the Father, but we're going to see more. But now we see John the Baptist, who's a second witness. And while Jesus doesn't depend on his testimony in and of itself, he's using John for a reason, that they might be saved. He wants these people to believe. There's an interesting thing that will come up a little bit later uh, and, and throughout the book. Uh, if all those people did listen to John, they ultimately rejected his witness, they rejected Jesus. Most of the Pharisees never got saved. We do know some did. I believe Nicodemus was one. And in Acts it tells us about it. You know, there were some others, although names aren't given, but there are a few. But most of the Jewish leaders didn't believe it. And in fact, most people don't believe. They refuse. Even when you tell them the truth. I still think of probably the most famous atheist of the day, Richard Dawkins. 
I have a feeling that if you asked him straight out, what would it, what evidence would you take that Christianity is true? And I have a feeling he would say none. Because of the way he talks about Christianity and God. Richard Dawkins is not a young man. There is a point where he is going to die. And if he hasn't repented, he's going to get a wicked surprise. And that's too bad. Dawkins is a highly intelligent man. But he doesn't believe. And he does not want to believe. Well, Jesus goes on here. Beginning in verse 36, he says, I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Well, we know that Jesus has turned water to wine. He's healed a couple of people. And according to what we've read, apparently while he, this is, these are things in Galilee, when he was in Judea, in Jerusalem, he did other things. His very works testify that he has been sent by the Father. And just think, he's going to do even greater ones. It was, it's really funny to watch some of the so-called miracles that go on today. There is one fella who claims he can, you know, if, if your one leg is shorter than the other, that he can lengthen it. But if you watch very carefully, it's nothing more than a manipulation. Or there was another one where the guy, the guy is standing like this, and I don't know if you can see it from back here, but I, one, one hand is shorter than the other here, the way it is. And this guy is, is going on, and he's like this, you know. And slowly you see the guy's hand move forward. Did any of you see my shoulder move? I bet you didn't, but it did. Why? It's so easy. Just very slowly. Just moving it out. You might see my hand go, but you won't see my shoulder move, but it did. There's so much false teaching in the world. And so many fake miracles. One of the false teachers said he's seen dozens of people raised from the dead. Not one time will you see any verification of that. It's a problem. But Jesus' miracles are different. <laughs> no, Pastor Wagner, you commented, I don't know how many times, whenever Jesus confronted a demon, all he had to do was say, come out. And it came out. I just love watching one of the so-called demon slayers today. The person will be rolling around on the stage and personal. When I count to three, demon has to come out, you know, and they'll count to three. And they'll count to three a second time. And a third time. Demons don't listen. Yeah, okay. Got a problem with that. But Jesus' works are different. When Jesus does things, it's evident. I mean, when you turn, anybody here want to turn water to wine? Wow. That's not an easy thing to do. The old alchemist that wanted to change lead into gold didn't work too well. Now beginning in verse 37. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you because whom he sent him you do not believe. Wow. I will tell you that if you listen very carefully to some of the things that are going on in the world, there are a number of people. I would suggest that Richard Dawkins might well be one of them. He could probably, he's heard it so many times from people like John Lennox and others, he could probably tell you the facts of the gospel. But he doesn't believe. He does not want to believe. 
But the Father bears witness through the works that He's given to Jesus. But they don't even believe in the Father, really. They've got their own things that they want to do and their own beliefs and the way they want to act and have other people act. And they really don't read the Scriptures for what they are, which is that God is willing to forgive sin, but you've got to admit you're a sinner. But these people, <laughs> you, think, you think of the one Pharisee who was praying in public and he was glad he wasn't a sinner like this other guy. We're all sinners. The Father has borne witness as well. Verse 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me, that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor which comes from the only God? Wow. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they read the scriptures, they search the scriptures, but didn't really believe the scriptures. And I find this interesting because Jesus plain puts, puts it very plainly as he can. You do not have his word abiding in you, verse 38. Because what he said, you don't believe. And he even said, you're not willing to come to me. I think if you take a really good look, at, and we've referred to this numerous times, Paul's done it, and I've done it, and I know Pastor Wagner's done it in the past, when he was here, Romans chapter 1, makes it very clear that human beings reject the truth. That's simple. We reject the truth. It's only when the Holy Spirit comes and convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment that anybody comes to believe. Again, I said I define depravity just a little different than some people uh, because while I some people think they talk about an inability to believe, but I think the inability comes from an absolute unwillingness to believe. People hear the truth, but as sinners they say, I don't want that. I don't want that because that makes me responsible. I don't want it. And they will not come. And no human being will ever come unless God works in his heart. That's simple. It's not going to happen. Jesus confronts him. He says, you are not willing. These people, he said, you want honor from one another. But you don't seek the honor that comes from God. This is kind of interesting because uh, it says the honor that comes from the only God. And there's one particular version of that says it comes from God alone. But if you actually look at the Greek, the word only actually modifies the word God. It is the only God. It is the place where true honor comes from, from God and God only. Great, we honor people. I it's not necessarily wrong to honor people in, in certain circumstances, but we cannot put them above God. Rightfully so. We honor veterans when it's appropriate. Rightfully so. We honor sports figures when they do certain things. Nothing wrong with that, unless you put them above honoring God. And it's so easy to honor people and not honor God. Then he goes on to say, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, 
Moses in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? For over a 17-month period, excluding, of course, all of those interruptions, or what includes all the interruptions that we had for things like Christmas and all the rest of that stuff, we went through the whole concept of the importance of the Old Testament. And unlike some of our scholars, whom I happen to disagree with, I truly believe that the Old Testament points to the Messiah. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that when the person who wrote Kings put it together, that everything in Kings directly refers to the Messiah. But God in his wisdom gave us scripture as a whole with many different things throughout that did directly or very, or at least to some degree indirectly pointed to the Messiah, but he gave us types and characterizations of the Messiah. And he gave us Jewish history to show us that yes, God created man, man sinned, and God needed to fix that. And he was going to do that through his Messiah, who he planned even before the foundation of the world. He planned for all of this to happen and how it was going to happen. And that all of the things in Jewish history throughout just didn't cut it. Paul's been going through dispensationalism and, and the concept of the dispensations. And if you look at all of these things, up to the time of Noah, people didn't do such a hot job when God flooded the world. After that, people wanted to build this huge tower up to heaven, and God confused the languages. Mankind still messed up. God wound up giving the law. But you know, God expected and planned for a theocracy where the nation of Israel, which was to be a light to the world, God had it all planned. He would lead it. But Israel rejected it. And God gave them judges. And we all know how that worked out. Most of the judges weren't so hot. They failed. Judges just didn't do it. And then they got a king. And the kings didn't do it. There were a few good kings. But on the whole, between Israel and Judah, when the, when the nation split into two parts, there weren't very many good kings. And then the Messiah came. But not everybody is jumping on the bandwagon. We can see that here, where the Jewish leaders as a whole didn't. And we're going to see later on in the book where a good many of the, not just the Jewish leaders, but the Jewish people would reject and turn away. Jesus here refers to Moses in Luke 24, which we've referred to numerous times. Jesus not only referred to Moses, but all the scriptures when he told the disciples on the Emmaus Road about himself. But there are plenty of witnesses to Jesus. Jesus himself is a witness and a true witness. Not the only one, however, because you have the Father. You have the works that Jesus did. You have the very word of God. And particularly, as Jesus pointed out through Moses, witnesses to Jesus as to who he is. And when Jesus said, Later in the book, before Abraham was, I am. You can count on it. It's the truth. Jesus would then say later, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We've looked around, and I know we've talked about it uh, many times, you know, things in Sunday school, uh, church services, and so forth. That things in this world are not necessarily too good right now. There will come a day when God will take care of it all. It's going to involve some things happening 
Paul's going to be talking about a lot of that when he gets to a Sunday school class on Revelation. There are going to be some not so nice things happen in this world once God judges things. And that reminds me of one. I was actually reading a book the other day. And, uh, the one of the that it's five views on inerrancy, and one of the people thinks that there's this big controversy between God, who ordered Canaanites killed as the Jews entered the land, and the Jesus of the New Testament, who says we should love our enemies. I think there's an underlying belief that when you say that it's a problem that God ordered Canaanites to be driven out or killed, because God did say, in fact, he would drive them out, not just kill them, but drive them out. That makes the assumption that they don't deserve it. Do you and I deserve death for sin? We do. But God, in his mercy and grace, sent his Messiah, Jesus Christ, so that we could be saved. And he gave us plenty of witnesses to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the truth. As he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get much more plain than that. Jesus will continue to make it clear as he goes through, as we go through the book, as he, as we'll look, Lord willing, next week, the feeding of the 5,000 and others. God has given us this book for a reason. So that we'll study it, read it, understand who Jesus is, come to him. And one of the things that we should do is bear witness to him and who he is. It's part of what we should be doing. We should live it and we should preach it as well. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this time in your word. We ask that you would put your blessing upon it hearts and lives might be changed by him. We thank you for Jesus Christ, for who he is. They truly is the way, the truth, and the life. Father, we thank you that you not only brought him into the world, but you gave abundant witness as to who he is. We thank you for that and help us in turn to be witnesses in our day and age. We ask it in Jesus' name. Paul? Thank you, Carol. Uh, let's finish up our service then with hymn number 16, How Great Thou Art. Let's stand.
Thank you, everybody. You are dismissed.